we do have quite a few people joining the webinar. So as a result, we do have you on mute mode. Uh, what we're going to do is if you do have any questions or anything throughout, feel free to use the chat and QA facilities and we'll go from there. Um, we have a nice mix of existing uh, dashboard gear customers as well as uh, those of you that are just interested in, in reporting. Um, so we'll have probably a combination of those questions for those of you that aren't dashboard gear customers. You might hear some of those as well. But uh, feel free to ask anything related to uh, reporting on workforce analytics, whether it be on dashboard gear or in general, and, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, I've got my screen shared, but I'm going to start the slide uh, presentation here. Let me see, I get a swap. Uh, my views, so hopefully I'll see that okay. Um, as I mentioned, if you do have any questions, use the, the chat facility. Um, from Dashboard Gear today, we have uh, myself, Rich Benningson, as well as uh, Tom Zidell from our sales organization uh, on. I'll primarily be doing um, the talking today. Um, I am a part of our implementation and development teams. Some of you know me, those of you that are uh, on the customer side. Uh, I oversee our implementation and consulting efforts. What we have at Dashboard Gear is uh, we were founded in 2007, and we do solutions for the M4 Lawson space as well as Kronos. Um, we have two sides to our business. We have a consulting practice as well as uh, a set of products and, and applications that we sell. Um, on the consulting side, we do everything business intelligence and reporting. So I mentioned a number of products here, SQL reporting services and Power BI and Burst and Import BI, Crystal Reports. We have consultants that do uh, most of the tools. I'm going to cover, um, try and keep this as generic as possible. When I'm, I'm going through, I'll show examples using a variety of tools uh, as we get in here. But as I'm doing this, if you run across any specific scenario you want me to cover, uh, Feel free to let me know, and I'll, I'll dive in uh, to those particular areas. Uh, I've been uh, in the M4 Lawson space uh, for 20, well, 27 years now, time flies, um, and so pretty familiar with the HR. Back in the early 90s, uh, I managed the HR payroll product at, at M4. At that time, there was only 40 people, and that covered the uh, – uh, the full development services and support organizations were all one at that time. So it's grown a little bit uh, since then, um, but kind of followed it and evolved over over the years and uh, all the way up to the current GHR and all the cloud offerings and so forth that's there. So uh, feel free to ask anything at, across the board uh, on those. Um, what we have about 200 implementations of our products per se, just in the uh, M4 and Chrono space. Um, and what those products uh, do, I'll cover some of that today using those examples, uh, covering all different verticals. About 50% of our customers are healthcare, and that kind of mirrors uh, the loss in S3 uh, market. Uh, the other 50% are everything from school districts, public sector, retail, across the board. So uh, it, it applies equally there. Um, one of the things that I wanted to cover today is in the case of HR reporting, it, a lot of confusion about what reporting and business intelligence is and so forth. What we have found is the best way to do is divide the reporting into two types. There's analytical type reporting and, and ad hoc, so you're asking questions or have high-level statistics. And then there's the more detailed operational blocking and tackling type reporting. I'm going to show examples from both. And as I'm doing that, it's going to uncover a number of terms and so forth that are common that you may hear. I'll try and uh, define those as I go through those, uh, just because I know there's a lot of a lot of buzzwords thrown out there. But if there's anything I I say at any time that you have a question on, just feel free to let me know. One of the first things is just why is it important to even understand analytics or the reporting, and that is. It can help you identify all those costs and savings in your organizations. And in the case of HR, it oftentimes has been behind the finance area because it's easier to quantify. But in the case of HR, if you just look at turnover, for instance, um, here I have a couple of statistics I'll show you in regards to uh, workforce analytics. In the case of a healthcare organization, uh, in a 2016 survey by NSI, uh, Nursing Solutions, Inc., they 
we're trying to identify the cost of turnover in, for RNs. And what they came down up with was that RN, the cost is between 37 to 58400 for every termination in a healthcare organization, with the average hospital losing 5.2 to 8.1 million dollars. Uh, so each percentage change in our intern over will cost or save an average hospital about $373,000. So we're talking real uh, dollars if you can grasp uh, why people are leaving and get a hold of those. So the first thing you have to do is be able to measure that. Um, how, how do you know uh, you're, you're doing a good job on that? In a similar kind of statistics across all the different um, areas. So in the case of schools, for instance, the average teacher, it costs about $15,000 uh, every time you lose a teacher. Um, in, in a larger one, Chicago was 17000 So Chicago schools estimate that they uh, have $86 million per year in cost just related to turnover. Uh, so very significant uh, dollars on that. So now that you have those statistics or can say, yeah, these are, um, it's important to track that. And I know many of you know that already because you're interested in this webinar. Those are the kind of things that you can use to quantify. And so the key thing for you to first is first identify what are those key metrics that you want to track. Now, I know some of you on the, on this um webinar that I've worked with are tracking things that correspond with like Saratoga Institute uh, and there's many other ones that are out there. So that's a good kind of um, basis that you can use to see what other things are doing. What some of those benchmarking in, uh, like Saratoga and some of the other ones that are out there do is they give you kind of a target in the population and you can say this is where we're at, this is how the average, how do we compare within that. And so um, that's a good way to do that. Now, when you're working with those, it's going to use some terms, and these are common terms in reporting and analytics. Uh, the first term they're going to use is measures, and those are basically the numbers that you're tracking. So in the case of uh, turnover, you know, how many, what is my turnover count? What is my head count? What is my separation rate? Anything that's a number that you're looking at, uh, you'll see those referred to a lot as either measures or facts. So if you hear that, just know it's just the number that you're looking at. Then what they'll do is they'll break things up by what are called attributes or dimensions. And those are two different things, but they get um, crossed with each other quite frequently. So a dimension are the things that you're going to slice those numbers up by. So in the case of HR, we're going to see things like employees, departments, periods of time, jobs, uh, type of term could be voluntary or involuntary, so forth. Those are um, dimensions or how you're going to slice up those numbers. So if you want to know what is my total turnover, so taking that measure by department, by job, by time period, so forth. So you, you slice those numbers up by those dimensions. What are attributes are from a you know, if you take Microsoft, uh, how they break up the difference between dimensions and attributes, and that's a common breakdown on that terminology, is an attribute is a piece of data within a dimension. So, for instance, um, a job can have a job code, a job class, and so forth. So jobs would be the dimension, job code, job class would each be attributes within that dimension. So you can further break that down. So I don't want to get too deep there, but just as I'm using terms of measures and dimensions, just know one is numbers, the other are the categories that you're going to break those uh, up by. All right. So in HR, there's literally thousands of measures available um, in in the uh, system. I am I have a, um, if I go ahead and I'll click on this, I should have opened this ahead of time, but it's Basically, there's a Word document that we can get you at the end where I just have been kind of bringing together common measures that are out there in the world of HR. So as you can see here, there's head count, FTE count, average head count, and so forth. Uh, so this can serve as kind of a, a checklist or a, um, item that you can use to, 
to decide different kinds of measures that you can do. But you can see there's all kinds of a maternity days and, and so forth that you would want to want to track. So it's a big number um, that's there. Dimensions, we already talked about what those are there. So what, um, what we do at Dashboard Gear is we have a product that takes your loss and data and it distills it down into those common measures and dimensions for you. Um, so we build two different types of databases and the top database I call reporting data mart is really all the details. And this goes along with what I was saying earlier on the different types of reporting. Sometimes you wanna do a summarized report that says show me my uh, head count for a particular job or you know, I always use the example, how many RNs did we have last July? You know, that kind of question, and that would be an OLAP cube. But in other types of reporting, you want to see detailed type reports, like what's a termination listing with all my people, or, uh, you know, a birthday listing, or who's all enrolled in a specific benefit plan. Um, those require more details, and then the reporting data mart is there. So what we do is we put the data both at the detail level as well as into cubes. So depending on what type of report you want to do, you can target each one. Now, what what we are not is we are not a front-end report writer. We partner with all kinds of people to do that. So, for instance, I get asked a lot, um, you know, how does this compare to LBI in the old days? Or now it's Burst. How does how does this compare to Burst? The difference is, is we're, we're not a front-end report writer. We work with those. So you use Burst on top of our data, or you use Crystal or LBI on top of our data. Uh, so oftentimes people are taking crystal reports and writing them right on your their Lawson database, which is fine, or taking, let's say, Burst, you can put it right on your Lawson database. The problem with that is, is you, ha you as a user have to know how to distill down and bring together all of that data. So what we try to do is, is simplify that down to where you don't have to do as much of that work as possible. And then we do some other things that you'll see here in a minute in regards to tracking history and, and some of those things uh, that I'll show you some of those fun uh, tools here shortly. But the best way for me to start getting into some of these reporting examples is just start building them. I'm, I'm gonna resist the urge of just showing a whole bunch of dashboards. I know in um, the BI world, a lot of vendors, what they'll do is they'll show all kinds of flashy dashboards that look great, get you excited, but they leave out how do you actually get there uh, or how do you apply it? And the point of today, what I want to do is show you more how to do these different things uh, on the system and the types of tools that you would use. Now, I had mentioned earlier OLAP cubes. OLAP cubes are really good at those kind of ad hoc questions uh, or the type of question that you would um, be summarized in nature. Uh, you can use any tool that can connect to an OLAP cube. Now, at Dashboard Gear, we use SQL Server as our data mart layer. So we take your data from, you know, Lawson, whether it be an Oracle or SQL or DB2 or out in the cloud or on-premise, it doesn't matter. We'll take that and we'll put that into a SQL Server data mart with what's called analysis services cubes. So if you've heard the term cubes before, it's really nothing more than another type of database that's running out there that specializes in ad hoc uh, or in, in high level reports. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to escape here and go to uh, Excel. Excel, um, which I'm willing to bet many of you are using Excel today for different things and are comfortable with that. Excel has built into it the ability to connect to those cubes. So you can use this as a kind of an ad hoc report writer uh, right out of the box. So what I would do is I would just go up to Excel here, and I'm using right now Excel 2016, but you can do the same thing on 2007 and greater. So it's not like it's uh, more current. It looks slightly different, but you can do the same types of things. Uh, if I go to the data menu and say get data from uh, a database, Built into Excel is the ability to connect to analysis services. So what you do is you say, I want to go to analysis services. You then put in your analysis services cube server, just keeping it on Windows authentication because by user, you can define who can see what types of cubes and data. 
Uh, so if you were using Tableau or Burst or any of those, you could use those on top of cubes as well, and it would be a similar process. But I'm just going to show you in Excel because I know you all can relate to that. Um, then you would do next. Now, I'm going to hit cancel here because what I want to do is I'm, once you've done that, it just saves it in Excel under this existing connections. So I'm going to go to um, my existing connections. When you connect to a cube in Excel, a cube is like a model that accomplishes a specific subject. Now, in the case of H our HR data marts, we have cubes for employee census data, we have payroll cubes, we have benefit cubes, we've got S3 cubes as well as LTM or GHR cubes, whatever terminology you want to use there, um, benefits. Um, we have cubes across all the different areas of the HCM area. And when you look at a cube, what it is is like a model of a specific subject so right now I'm looking at the S3 HCM cube. It would look slightly different for the GHR or the LTM because um, of what I mentioned earlier around the, the measures and, and dimensions and so forth are slightly different, but I think I'll, I'll bring that back here in a, in a second. At the top of a cube, it shows those facts or those measures right at the top. So in the case of the employee census here, I'm looking at some overall facts. And it says based on effective date, based on enter date in general. Well, one of the things that we do is we take all that personal action history, HR history, and PRA history that you make the changes, and we gather it based on effective date or enter date. So as we're doing that, as long as you're tracking it, we'll pick that up. So maybe I want to see the active count of something based on the effective date. So what I do is I just bring that measure down to the values, and it shows up over here on the left. Now that measure, uh, the way a cube works is it's gonna show you the total of whatever measure you're looking at for everything that's in the system. Now in the case of um, HR, it doesn't mean a whole lot to see the total active count all time of everything. You need to break that up. And how you do that is you break that up by these dimensions down below. In the case of HR, you always want to use one dimension that's called HR periods, or what period of time am I looking at? So what you do is you take whatever dimension you want to look at, so period in this case, and I'll put that on my filter. I can say, what was the active count in you know, February of 2009, 156? I then can just look at that by any other combination of these dimensions. So it makes it very easy for you as a user to say, what was the count by age, gender, ethnicity, job code? It doesn't matter. It excels at kind of summarizing those numbers up by the combinations of these dimensions. What a cube doesn't do very good is it doesn't do detailed type reporting. So if you wanted to do like this listing of, say, show me all the employees in my system that have, you know, this birthday and hire date and whatever they happen to be, um, a cube is not the right place for that. What a cube does are these high-level statistics like this. What's the active count or maybe the term count? I don't have any terms in my system, so I'm going to do something a little more uh, crazy here. I'm going to take, um, like, let's say I wanted to see ethnicity instead of age, all I do is I drag that off and bring ethnicity down. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you can also do trending. So instead of showing an individual period, I could put periods down on the rows and say, I just want to see everything in 2008. And I want to see that by period there within it. All my, all my months are the same. So it's going to be a little boring to look at on that. But basically, you can see across periods. So what this works out really well for is any kind of trend reports. If I want to see my term counts over time, my head counts over time, any of that kind of thing, it's got all of that into it. Now, these measures that are up here, so I'm looking at active count, but they could be things like active count. They could be the end of month active count. And in our case, what we do for active count versus end of month is we say active count is anything they were active at any time in that month. End of month is what was my count at the end of the month. Um, so if there was terms and so forth, that would be reflected uh, in that. You can see promotions, rehires, terms, and so forth. Uh, you can get down to as, as finite as saying, I want to see a first-year uh, turnover. Uh, so I want to count of all my first-year terms, which is a common one we do with our healthcare customers. They want to track first-year terminations or 
you can get more granular than that if you want. Uh, so it's just a matter of defining those measures that you want to see by these combinations of uh, dimensions. I'm going to pause for a second and just see if there's any questions uh, or anything that come in around cubes so far. All right, so I got I just got one um, in regards to can you see deeper than that as far as the specific employees or anything that is in that? And the answer is yes, um, but you do have to do one other step. So for instance, right now I'm looking at active count by gender by period. I'm going to put period up in my filter again so I can say show me the active count um, for um, we'll just do do. I'm going to do 2009 because I don't know if I have data for 2008 there. I'm going to do um, active count for May of 2009 is 156. If I want to see the detail employees behind that, um, I can do that. But the first thing I have to do is add one more filter on that says what type of employees to show in my list. And they all start with show. So I'm going to say show active employees uh, because I'm showing an active count here. So I'll just say show active employees, yes. Now what I can do is I can go to my employee listing dimension, which has all my employee data, and I can just start putting, there's my current employee numbers and names, or if I go under more fields here, some dimensions have just a listing and um, with more fields. So like if I wanted to see the adjusted hire date and the birth date, and the city, or whatever it is that you want to see, you can start adding additional fields. I don't have any, or a few cities in there. Um, what Excel does here makes it kind of ugly. It's putting in what's called the compact form. Um, so if I come up here on the design menu uh, in Excel, everything I'm doing here is just standard Excel. So I'm not doing anything with dashboard gear per se. All we did was build the cube, but everything here is standard Excel. So there's all kinds of resources and all kinds of things you can do. But one of the things Excel does is they do this pivot table in a compact form first, but I can go to the report layout and say show it in tabular instead and don't show subtotals. And so now what it's going to do is allow me to create whatever, more of a standard style listing that you're used to. So it's got the employee and this hire date and the birth date and the city and so forth. What's nice about these Excel files like this um, is that you can save them and what it does is it saves it as a standard spreadsheet, but it also saves it with a connection to the cube itself. So um, by having it as a saved connection to the cube, uh, you can open it up again next month. And let's say, let's say we were in May 2009, now it's June. I just open it back up again next month and say, I want to see what it is now in, in June. Um, you can switch over and switch it to June that way, and it will go get me my new data for June. So everything is connected to the database as well as a spreadsheet you can share with others. So a real good tool for kind of this ad hoc, just queries, like I said, you want to know who worked in a specific job or, or how many people termed or any of that, works really good for that. And we have cubes um, for different subject areas in there. This was the employee census, so things around my employee population. But we also have cubes for other things. So like if you wanted to see data related to, um, there's a popular one in HR, is the HR audit log. So one of the things we do is we take anything that's been logged, and I kind of showed that was used in that employee census cube, but we also create a cube specific to that. And we do that both for the GHR as well as the S3 side. And we'll take all the changes that have been logged We'll put that into a cube. Now, in this case, measures usually aren't used too much because I'm kind of abusing what this cube is for. It's not really for um, trending or anything like that. It's more for using it as a report. But we get we got so many requests for doing reporting on the audit logs, uh, whether it be on the XML-based audit logs that's on the GHR side, we explode all that out, or on the S3 side um, that we added cubes for that. And so how you work with that is you find the dimensions here. Maybe I wanted to see all the changes that occurred for a particular date range. I can either do that based on the date of the change or the effective date. So I can put that up in the filter and say, show me everything changed in 2008. I can say, show me all the employees that had the change. So I can just put employees down here. 
I can say show me the, the fields that were changed. So there's the item names here. What was their old value of those fields and the new value of those fields? Here again, I got this ugly look. So I'm gonna go back up here to design and change it to tabular, not show. So now we have for 2008, every employee that had a change, what fields were changed on theirs and what the old value and the new, new value was. Looks like that's kind of boring information for expense accounts. Let me see if in 2009 I had anything better. Yes, here we have a few more things. So how how some of these are, are changed. So here's pay rate I see is a pretty common one. So the most common use, quite honestly, of this is I want to see someone that either came from a specific value or went to a specific value or say, show me all the pay rate history. Uh, what you would do is you'd put up into the filter whatever it is that you're filtering on. So in this case, I wanted to say all the pay rate changes. So I could say I only want to see things for the item name is pay rate. And then it will show me all the employees, old value, new value within that change date range. You can also see the reason codes and action codes. Uh, any, really anything that you want to relate to that, we'll put into the cube for you. Uh, so as long as you can relate it to your specific HR data, so the employees or the changes, uh, those could become dimensions in here. What I'm showing you in these cubes to begin with is what we call our, our base model. And that is we take all the standard things that people have requested uh, and we put into kind of a standard deliverable. We then will modify it based on whatever it is that you'd like to, to put in there from your uh, loss inside. So if there's other um, tables or so forth you want to add in, so let's say you're a union shop now, you want to add a union code, we'll add in union code um, or account unit attributes from the financial side, uh, all different things that way. Uh, we can add those into these cubes uh, that's there. So this is the audit log cube. This is the S3 audit log cube. The LTM GHR one, very similar. The difference there is obviously it's it's pulling in from the GHR side. Uh, one difference that you all might not be aware of if you're not on GHR, and I know very few of you are, um, is if you do go to LTM or GHR, they no longer log the changes to individual database fields. Those are logged as uh, chunks of XML in the database, but what our process does is explode those out and and make those reportable uh, either in SQL Server or you know using whatever reporting tool you want or in these cubes as well. So that's um, that's available there. Let's pause for a second and see any other questions. Uh, yep, payroll. Yep, we do have payroll cubes. There's two payroll cubes. We have a payroll check cube as well as a payroll distribution cube. For payroll, we'll put whatever you want in either of those two cubes. The reason we separate them is for two reasons. One is we find that a lot of organizations separate out the payroll reporting function to a finance function. And so we take the payroll distribution cube and we make it more finance oriented where we put in the accounts, the account units, um, and less HR sensitive data. Um, and on the payroll check cube, we tend to put more for compensation analysis or HR type data. So for instance, if I come in here, let me find my, um, here's payroll check cube. Payroll check cube, for instance, you can look at, you know, hopefully you'll see the concept apply over and over again here at the top are those measures. So if you wanted to see the payroll dollars, you can see that. If you wanted to see that by particular, um, maybe you wanted a specific type of pay uh, you can use what's called the amount type dimension. And what we do in there is we combine all the pay and deduction codes. So let's say I wanted to see all the overtime pay. I could go into pay. I can pick overtime. It'll show me the total overtime. I probably don't want it for all time periods. So I'll put in a check date range here and just say, I want to see all the overtime pay in 2008. Uh, there's a million dollars worth. And of that, I want to see the employees that got it. And then maybe I want it by department. So I could go here under my department dimension and say, I just want to see department full name, which is the number and the name together. So now you can see by department, the employees that had overtime. So the same concept, really the key is understanding the measures that you've got there and then understanding the dimensions. And the key thing here is 
you as a report writer don't have to know how to combine, you know, in this case it was PR, you know, paymaster and, and PR time and uh, employee and PR check was involved here, pay deduction um, and all the different tables on payroll. You'd have to know how to combine all those things, whereas in a cube, it just does that. So instead, it unlocks you to be free to use the report writer for what it does best. So whether you're using Burst or Tableau or Excel in this case, uh, you don't have to understand you know, all those joins across uh, to do that. On the finance side, people get tend to get a little more adventurous with Excel, but if you are a very good Excel user, just also note that you could do like equals cube, and there are formulas built right into Excel that allow you to query the values directly out of the cube. So rather than using um, a pivot table, uh, like what I was using over on the left, which some people don't like to be constrained by that, you can use formulas and get values directly out. So you can freeform anything. I've had people do benefit statements and so forth just using those formulas where they can type in uh, the values and then query the cubes that way. So that those are cubes, um, a very powerful tool to do kind of ad hoc reporting or analysis, not very good for doing detailed uh, kind of structured reporting. For that kind of reporting, you usually want to use a different type of tool that's a standard report writer going against um, our reporting data mark. So if I go back here to my my slide just to kind of hammer home that point. What we do is we take the data out of your source systems, Lawson, Kronos, whatever it happens to be. You can bring in other data too. So if you want to bring in Epic or what we do a lot on the um, HR side is things like API for time cards or um, recruiting systems, Taleo or, or any of those. We can, uh, People Fluent is one we brought in stuff for. Um, we'll bring that in, put that into our data mart and then generate these cubes out of it. These cubes are more of those summaries of values out of the data mark. But if you want to get down to the nitty gritty detail in our data mark, we've got uh, a lot of that data. And you can use any tool you want uh, to connect to that. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to go over here to um, another, just one of my dev servers that I've got. And this product here is called SQL Server Reporting Services. It's a free report writer with SQL Server. We have customers that use this. We have customers that use Crystal. Some that are just starting to use Burst, Tableau. It doesn't matter. The point is I'm just going over to a standard kind of uh, report writer. I'm going to show this one because we do have a set of sample reports we deliver uh, in this. I happen to publish a couple of them out uh, into this dev server just for this uh, presentation today. And the one I'm going to show you is, is the metrics dashboard. And if I go ahead and I click on this, uh, metrics dashboard, it's going to run uh, and present uh, a number of metrics that are out there. And we use this one to show that there's different types of charting and graphing and you can do to present data in different ways. I'm not saying it's the best way to present in each of these because we wanted to show uh, kind of a variety uh, for you. But um, for instance, this gender donut that's here, if I click on this, um, in this particular tool, you can link multiple reports together, and most of them allow you to, to link multiple reports uh, together. And so what I'm showing you here is I clicked on that one gender donut. It went to another report passing it, what I was looking at, showing me more breakdowns by that. Now, I could have built that first dashboard and this dashboard here off of a cube or a SQL data mark just because it is... Uh, summarized in nature. But let's say I want to drill one level further, so this head count of 48, it's going to go to another report that has a lot more details or the details behind that, um, those statistics that are there. This one you could have done potentially out of a cube because there's not that many, but a lot in a lot of cases uh, that just wouldn't perform well. So that would go off of our SQL data mark. The reason I kind of showed you this path through, like if I go back to the home dashboard where I went to the gender dashboard, or if I go to even the headcount dashboard, which breaks down headcount in different ways, much like I broke up the gender one. We also have a turnover dashboard that does the same thing in these sample ones here. The reason I kind of showed you that path through it is these are using a facility that we called a reporting table. And what's a reporting table? So 
Some of you are technical and, and some are, are not. What we do, and I went over to SQL Server here, and this is a, a database. Now, you don't have to be familiar with this per se, but it's going to allow me to show uh, a whole bunch of uh, samples uh, of types of tables and so forth uh, that are here. And um, that report that I just showed you uh, is coming off of a table that we call the RPT employee census as of. And what we do when we build our data marts is the first thing is we copy in all kinds of data, just right out of the, um, natively out of the box. Then we start adding value to it. The first type of value that we do is we read that data and we make it easier to use. And the, actually one of the very first tables we build after we get the data, we call the HR change log. And those of you that have tried writing a lot of reports on, on HR, you're, you'll probably be familiar with some of the problems that come in of history reporting. So one thing we heard over and over when we first implemented this is the difficulty in creating historical reports on HR. Because what Lawson does, first on the S3 side, I'll talk about that. What Lawson does when they record things um, is they, um, they record things as, uh, as it happens as a transaction. So if you change the pay rate, it records it in PR rate. His is being, you know, it was changed to this. Or if they change a job code, it says the job code was changed to this. What it doesn't have is any relativity as far as time goes or as well as what the old value goes. So what we do in this change log is for every field that was changed, we figure out the old value and the new value of that field and the date range that that field applied to. So that for any field in the system, you can know what the value was at any point in time for an employee. So while we have some people that use this for their reporting, uh, I don't have too many. We use this internally to do a lot of further processing. So we take this that has the ability to generate point in time for any field uh, in the system uh, on the S3 side. For GHR, we read the uh, XML audit logs and we generate database tables that has the same kind of information to it. So we generate those change logs, but then what we do is we start building tables that give you additional values. And so for that example that I was showing you, um, I was showing you a dashboard that was um, filtered for a particular time. And I see one question came in about, you know, was that filtered or for a hard coded value or whatever. If I come up here, this, this was actually using uh, parameters at the top, which are dri driven it. I defaulted it to 2012 period nine. You normally on a uh, production system or like if it was on your system, it would default to the current year and month or, or some of our customers want it to be the prior year and month, but these can be changed. So like if I wanted to run this for period eight or whatever, it's just a parameter that, that changes. So if I run this for, for period eight and ran it for period eight, um, if I go back here, this table that we generate for every employee, we figure out the value for every period of time. And these values are their user fields and all the common reporting things. This is kind of a, a thing we do a lot where we'll combine kind of a key value. So company will get its descriptive value, and then we'll get the number and the name together, and we usually call that the full name. So we do that for all the common employee records in this table. So this RPT employee census as of has it for every period of time, for every month. It's got each employee and their values as of that month. But then what we also do is we flag those values with those common measures. And so over here, you'll see term status EFF. If they were terminated in that month based on effective date, so when you see EFF, that means based on effective date. We also have ENT, which means based on entered date. So if they were terminated based on an effective date, they would get a one in this. So all of your reporting, all you have to do is either filter or sum these values so if you wanted to do a term listing, you would say just where term status EFF equals one and, you know, this job, the job equals X or this period of time equals X, however you wanted to form, format it. And then those same things as you saw in the cubes where we have the record status and the EOM record status. So you can get the same kind of statistics out of this table as you could a cube. So what I find myself doing, I'm, I'm comfortable in, in standard report writers, so um, I 
I'm familiar with Crystal and SQL reporting services and so forth. I tend to just use these SQL tables and write reports on that. Now, the typical uh, report writer usually takes about a day to learn how to write reports uh, using um, SQL reporting services, for instance. Like when I go out to, to train users on creating these reports, it's about a day process to learn the tool. Um, I usually recommend two or three days of training, though, altogether, where we learn the tool one day and then we write reports together for a couple days. So that's usually the process. But basically, you learn the tool, and it's very easy to do because instead of you being hung up on learning how do I join and learn all those table relationships, our tables and our data marks are, are summarized down and reflected to make that process much easier for you. So you can either write reports directly against the detailed tables, which we have in our data mark, or by using our different reporting tables that we have. And we've got a number of them there. I showed you the change log. Uh, we do a number of things like that RPT employee census as of. Some of the things will flatten out, like another common pattern you'll see on the HR side is things are individual fields, but we'll, we'll pivot them across. So here's user fields, for instance. If you're familiar with how user fields are done, they're, in, they're a separate record for each one. So you'll have a record for user field one and a record for user field two. So if you're writing a report, you do a join and a join and a join. <laughs> to do it over and over to get all the different user fields, what we do is we pivot it and flatten it out. So if you want user fields, we have for every employee all their user fields on one row with all their values on that, that one row. So we have that uh, for you LTM GHR users. Um, and I know you'll you probably be familiar with this. If you're our customers now, there's um, for each table that's logged, we have a table that's there. We'll generate that change log, what I showed you, with all the uh, changes that occurred. But we go one step further on the GHR side. The snapshot table, we generate, um, I'll show you here, easier that way, begin date and end date on it. So for each begin date and end date, we have what the records are. So you can get it for any point in time uh, using that. So for each begin date and end date, you can get the point in time value for the employee, the work assignment, whatever it happens to be uh, on that. So we have tables like that uh, on the GHR side. We do things on the supervisor side. So like HR supervisors, we have a number of flavors of that. One that I use a lot is the supervisor employee table, and I'll explain why I use that one a lot shortly. What this table does is for each supervisor code, it shows all the employees that roll up to that. Now, oftentimes when you're doing reporting, one of the things that you struggle with is how do I do reports that show me all the people that roll up and down the chain? You know, sometimes you can get at it fairly easy by saying show me everything that reports to John Doe, but it but most of the time you want to say, show me anything below John Doe. I'm a director. I want to see all the people below my managers and, and so forth. Um, this table allows you that shows all the employees downstream of that. If you just wanted to see who reported them, we have other ways of doing it. We have flattened out structures like this uh, supervisor structure where it's for each employee. It shows their supervisors um, from top to bottom here. So up and down the chain, so you can kind of see that all in one one row that way. So just depending on what you're trying to do, we put the data in different different ways that way. And then in some cases, the tables are just direct copies uh, of loss, and we give you a facility to do that uh, either way. Uh, look over here and see if there's any more questions while I'm doing this. All right. Yeah, so the, so the, que the one question was related to, um, I mentioned earlier, our base implementation uh, on these cubes. So these cubes come out as kind of a, uh, out of the box. All of these reporting tables come out of the box uh, as well. Um, and it, it's about a week process for us to do the initial install. So what we do when we install this is we ask you a series of questions. Um, about how do you define an active employee? How do you define a terminated employee? How do you define a promotion? Those kind of things based on your personal actions, we then put that into our uh, mapping engine. And then from that, 
everything downstream uh, is generated. So what that helps you with is rather than you coding it in every report that says, okay, I only want to consider active people, those that have this status and this status or uh, this FTE code and that status, whatever whatever your rules happen to be, um, whoever's um, – Whatever your rules are there, rather than you coding that in every report, we put that into our engine, and then we fl start flagging those tables with that. So it already is is just indicated this is an active person, this is a term person. You can always override that. So if certain reports you do want to include uh, interns versus normally you don't, you always can add that. I mean, it's just a stand. All the, the details that you would need to do that are in there. Like if I go back here to my RPT employee census, you still have, um, going here, you still have uh, the different job codes and status codes and job classes and all that kind of thing, information in here. So you, you can filter, add whatever else you wanted to do. Here's that master status, full-time, part-time, whatever. So if you do want to add or override things, you can do that um, in the system very easy. Um, so no no problems there. Um, there are other types of reporting too. So I, I showed you these dashboards here, like on this HR, where I had that. You can just do standard detail uh, reporting. Sometimes there's a kind of a blurred line and different tools do it differently. One that I've been starting to uh, show a little more is Power BI, which is a tool from Microsoft. Uh, we're just starting to work with Infor on their tool, Burst, which is another one just like this. Um, and these are, tend to kind of blur that line between the graphics and the reporting. Uh, they each do a little different, but at the end of the day, the key is if you put that on top of the data mart where the data is there, it's much easier to look at the data and, so, and navigate down. Like I can double click things, it'll show it there. You can have active counts, so forth uh, across that. So this tool here is called Power BI. They have a web version as well as a desktop version. You can use that, um, or you can use SQL reporting services, which is this free one that's that's here. Which free is always a good uh, free is always good <laughs> on that. So I'm going to pause here and just see if any other questions have come in. If anyone's got any other examples or specific types of reporting, I'd be happy to answer those too or show you examples uh, on how to do that. All right, the data mart cost uh, was one. So I would mentioned it's um, about a week to put in. Our price is, we have two different pricing models. We're just in the process of switching. Those of you that are existing customers probably weren't aware of this, but that's it. Um, our normal, normally you can license it as a one-time license fee of 30,000, and that's the software, the installation, and the first year maintenance. We're in the process of switching over to annual, uh, more of a subscription model. So we, right now we would do either either way, whatever uh, is, is more advantageous to you. Um, the uh, after the first year, there's a 20% maintenance fee, so $6,000 a year. But what you get for that is we'll change it at any time. You don't have to have any technical resources. So if you want to change, all you do is you contact your, uh, you get assigned a personalized uh, consultant rep that is. Uh, familiar with your system, they're the ones that would do all the changes. So you just submit a request to them and said, you know, let's say I was your rep, you would say, Rich, can you add, um, you know, union code to my payroll cube? Or can you um, split my account unit into two pieces? My left three is location and my right two is department or whatever it happens to be. Um, we will we will do, do that. Um, so whatever whatever you want to do, you get that as part of it, as well as upgrades. So as you upgrade from one version of loss into the next, we'll we'll make changes. Um, I just got a question here that said, can SSRS dashboards that you show be deployed on an LBI dashboard tool? The answer to that is yes. Every one of these. Um, so LBI is a framework that has a dashboard component, and then it also has a report writer that you could do like. Um, Crystal reports in and has smart notes, has a bunch of tools, but one of them is a dashboard, kind of a wrapper. And what you can do on there is you can put any URL on there. Every one of these reports that's part of uh, SSRS is just a URL. So if I go up to the top here, 
you'll notice this is a URL. If I put that onto the dashboard uh, on LBI, it would run it just like any other URL or if you were going to Google or anything else for that matter. Uh, so they were, it works really well together. Um, one of the features that people used a lot with LBI, and we've added a, a, an optional component, uh, part of SSRS is what is bursting. So what I showed you here is a dashboard, but a common use case comes in where I want manager A to see a, da a dashboard for just their process level and manager B to see just their process level. Um, you need to filter that. What a lot of people would do uh, is have to create multiple dashboards. Well, we've added a component um, that allows you to define filtering by user. So, for instance, I can define for a particular user. I'm signed in as the DBG dev user, and it says test filter. It's got activity as 100 or 200, which just means it's filtered by activities. I was working earlier on a sample, so I apologize. This is not a... Uh, this is not an HR example, but I think you'll get the point of it. So my, my report is RBA for my activities. <laughs> so I can see activity 100 or 200. The way this tool works is for whatever filter that you've mapped to that report, and that report I've mapped to this filter called test filter, I can define a rule for each user. So I can say user DBG dev could see activity is in list 100, 200, or I could just say I can only see uh, 100. Um, I can't see uh, anything else, so I'll just update that to be 100. Now when I go back here and if I run this report again, I should just see 100 in my list. There's just 100. I got rid of 200. So what it does is it filters. Uh, I, I hesitate to call it security. It's more like a filtering. It, it, it is kind of a security uh, layer that's there, and but it's more from a you only see what what is relevant to you. And how it's doing that is it's passing behind the scenes the user ID that's looking at it. It's adding dynamically those parameters uh, that um, I showed you. So like if I go back to that HR report, one of my DPG HR reports, on this metrics dashboard, it had these parameters. It's, it's filtering dynamically by adding parameters, whatever those rules are that are there, and filtering the content down below. So it allows you to create one report that can be consumed by each process level manager or director or whatever they can see. So I had mentioned earlier, I use that supervisor table that's all downstream. I tend to create a rule that's mapped to, here's all the employees I can see. So me as a supervisor, it would automatically filter based on that. And so that, that SSRS filtering tool is an optional tool. We call it a report distribution kit. Um, and that, that's something that is available if you do want to use SSRS uh, for your reporting. That's a, that's a pretty popular item. All right. What other questions are out there? I'm not seeing any other questions uh, at this time, but... Um, I'll pause for a little bit if anyone has any other questions or any uh, anything related to HCM payroll reporting, feel free to ask and I'll uh, do this. We're doing another uh, webinar if I come out here. Um, you know, here's a sample dashboard that one, someone built in SSRS. This is one of our customers uh, that's a healthcare customer. Um, they built this dashboard uh, using SSRS. On, they have a combination of, they were just in the process of switching over to GHR at the time. So most of this is coming out of GHR, but uh, some of it's coming out of S3 as well as a third party uh, job rec system uh, that they had. Um, so they're, they're doing that. We are doing additional webinars. Next month we're doing supply chain, and then in July we're doing finance as well. But if you do have any questions when we get into it, um, feel free to contact myself, Rich Bendixson, or Tom, who's in our sales organization. Uh, those are our email and phone numbers. Um, if you have any suggestions on future webinars or any feedback, please do send it uh, our way, um, and we'll uh, go from there. I do get one question. Uh, So the one question I got here was about SSRS, um, if that's a separate program that you have to install. 
Um, so SSRS is a portion of SQL Server. So um, it's a component of SQL Server environment. So what you do is you install that and you write reports using that tool uh, on top of our data mart. So it's not our SSRS isn't um, Dashboard's gear product. This is a part of SQL Server that you can use. So it has to be turned on on your SQL Server. Once it's turned on, um, then to create reports, um, is just a matter of if I come back here to home, I can say I want to do a new report. It installs a report writer uh, and this report distribution, which is just a web browser, is all that the report consumers need. So it uses this tool. It would be just like if you use Crystal or if you use Cognos or Tableau. It is another product, but it's a part of SQL Server that's there. So the reason we uh, choose this for our samples is it's free with SQL Server. And we, because we require SQL Server for our data mark, we know you all have a license to it. So you may have to turn that on uh, on your SQL Server if you haven't already. But once you turn that on, it's just a matter of granting. If I come up here to this uh, settings, um, I can do site settings. I can say here who my users are uh, of my report server or not, whether or not they can write reports or not. Uh, but once you do that, then everything is turned on and you can use that um, to write those reports. Uh, let's see, I got, uh, got another one about, I must be an existing customer. I'll have to, about getting training on that. Um, and yes, we can definitely do training on SQL reporting services. Uh, we've, we're doing that quite a bit lately. Uh, it, like I said, I usually the minimum you'd want to do is one day if you just want to learn the basics of the SQL reporting services. But I usually recommend a two or three day process. What we have found is the best way to learn creating like the dashboards and the SQL reporting is to do a one day training on the tool and then do uh, another couple days of side by side report writing where you actually write the reports. And then your trainer can, you know, work with you and, and learn through real world world processes. What we found is a lot of people would uh, spend the time learning on the training side, and then they would have a hard time kind of applying it to um, the actual product. But after a couple days, they're usually off and running uh, for that. So usually a couple days is what you would need to do. And what you'd want to do is contact um you know, your your normal uh, support person. Uh, or if you're not sure who that is, contact either Tom or myself, and we'd be happy to give you, uh, get you all set up from that perspective. All right, other questions? Let's see here, looks like another one. About copy of the presentation, absolutely, we can get you a copy. Um, if you would like a copy, send send a request to Tom uh, down below. He'll have a copy of it, and he can send uh, send that out to you. So if you'd like a copy, just send an email to Tom, and he'll he'll do that. I am recording it as well, so hopefully that turns out good. And like I said, I'll put that on our website uh, if it if it worked. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? All right, I'm not seeing anything else, so I'll just I'll hang out here for a minute or two more, and and uh, if anything comes in, I'll answer it. Otherwise, thank you all for attending, and uh, feel free to send us any other feedback of future webinars you'd like, and uh, we'll go from there. <laughs>